for the nail biter last night. Voters showed up at the polls. In Virginia, for example, turnout was double of 2016 primary. The other 13 Super Tuesday states saw a varied turnout. In my home state of Texas, long lines like this one in Houston were actually pretty normal. Wow. And Senator Bernie Sanders' ground game was very strong in that state. With almost 92% of the precincts reporting this morning, he couldn't pull out there a win against Joe Biden, however. Did Bernie's groundwork churn out the number of voters his campaign expected? Front of the show and Sanders senior advisor Chuck Rocha joins us now to give his take on the center's performance overall last night, as well as in the Lone Star State and out in California. Chuck, great to see, see you. Chuck. Sleep is highly overrated. And we Indeed. Just we're right Sleep when we're dead, you. Chuck. Yeah, yeah. Here we go. All right. So all right. first of all, how are you viewing the results from last night? Just give us your takeaways. Look, we want to win every state. And as the senator said the other night, he goes, we're not going to always win them all. But I need folks at home to stay grounded, step away from your keyboard for two seconds and listen to me. We're going to be just fine. And we're going to, after they count all of these delegates in California, eh, Biden may be ahead 10, 20, 25 if he's having a good night. And we're going to be right where we need to be. Sure, I would have liked to have picked up Texas. Thank God a whole bunch of Latinos voted in That's Texas. Right. Yeah. And thank God people stayed in line. The most disgusting thing I saw last night that really upset me in our home state is if we've got enough money to do all the things we do in government, can't we get voting machines at work yeah, and get enough people there wrong. so they don't have to stand in line for three, four, five hours? Like, it was wrong. So oh wrong. My God, it just upset me so bad. But look, everybody at home, it was a big night. And we are right where we need to be because we start this thing where you back up now. You go, okay, where did we do really good? Mm -hmm. The Latino program seems rock solid. How do we grow that? Right. Okay. We can improve here. Here, how do we get young people vote up? Maybe we did this for that, and it didn't work. Now you have time to fix that, and you're going into states that are still pretty good for us as you think about Washington and Michigan. To play devil's advocate there, I mean, so David Axelrod there on the next 10 states, and I think Sanders lost eight of them in 2016. So what's the plan? Actually, did not live up to his 2016 margins, even in the home state of Vermont, places mm -hmm. like Massachusetts, and in Minnesota. It seems that there is a deficit amongst non-college-educated whites, which traditionally he was doing quite Quite well with and with the suburban maybe older vote what is the plan specifically there because you've got your everything locked down and if it wasn't for the latino strategy you outlined i think you'd be dead in the water but that's the new uh, focus what's the plan the plan is to draw a contrast of the candidates who are left standing right mm -hmm. As you head into the heartland, the part you're talking about, we did kind of underperform there four years ago, but we've learned a whole lot since then, right? And the one thing that Bernie Sanders has is credibility with working class Americans, and people like to put white people into that category only, but there's a, a there's ton a right. of working class all across all genders, all people of color. And, you know, I tell people all the time about the factory I worked in in Tyler, Texas, where we made Kelly Springfield tires, and it sits in China now because of bad trade deals. Right. We're going to talk a lot about trade deals and talk a lot about U.S. jobs, and pick it from what we've been doing in certain areas that may not have worked as well into other areas. The great thing about this campaign and the leadership of this campaign and the senator is we can walk and chew gum at the same time and we will leave no stone unturned to come up with that strategy mm -hmm. to make sure we're doing things better and not taking any vote for granted. Sure. Well, and in fact, you all are up right away today with uh, ads drawing that contrast with Joe Biden. I think everyone sees this is down to a two person race um, specifically on the issue of Social Security. Let's take a listen to that. When I argued that we should freeze federal spending, I meant Social Security as well. I meant Medicare and Medicaid. I meant veterans benefits. I meant every single solitary thing in the government. And I not only tried it once, I tried it twice, I tried it a third time, and I tried it a fourth time. Well, we've got some bad news for them. We are not going to cut Social Security. We're going to expand benefits. So... Gloves are off. You're drawing that contrast. First of all, should those ads have been on the air before South Carolina, before Super Tuesday? Is it too late? And how do you think that this ultimately plays? I think that you'll notice that people made their decision late. And I heard y'all talking about it earlier today that people made their decision. This may be the biggest election where you had this late surge, right? Huge. But yeah. also remember all these debates and all these moments in time during this process. Things have been happening really quick. And we're going to run against Joe Biden. And Joe Biden's apt to say some things or do some things and have some debates. And like there's anything still that happened. Still, still, still Joe, Joe Biden, right? And <laughs> we're going to draw a contrast. But I'm just going to yeah. say that it's a different race now. And all depending on hap what happens with Mr. Bloomberg, with Senator Warren, like there's lots of things that are going to ha happen dramatically fast and people are making up their mind later in the process than ever before. That's one thing that was new to me and something we have to take into consideration of thinking ahead. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and that is one thing I think we discounted is that how things, things, how fast things could move. Speaking on Senator Warren in particular, is the campaign disappointed because it seems that her vote 
could be, it's probably 50-50, maybe 60-40, that some of that vote would have gone to Senator Sanders. She stripped away delegates and has basically made this current situation worse for him. Is the campaign disappointed in Senator Warren for staying in and for doing this? You know, I saw, uh, I saw Faz on TV last night, and he was talking about this, and I agree with him wholeheartedly, and, and me and Faz have become really, really close during this campaign. And he said, who are we to tell them how to run their campaign? I'm sure if I'm just prognosticating as a 31-year veteran running campaigns, there's a lot of self-evaluation going on over there. We're going to do that, too. Any good campaign campaign does not stay the same campaign all the time. You're constantly trying to make yourself better. Right. This Latino strategy was from 30 years of me figuring out what other folks hadn't been doing. We're now going to look at that at Michigan, not just with Latinos, but with all people of color. With black folks, we do really good with African Americans under a certain age. We're going to look at African Americans over a certain age, and we're going to pivot and make sure that we leave no stone unturned to get the senator's message to all people. Sure. Well, and one of the areas of weakness and where we saw that massive consolidation was with the suburban vote. So, They've been floating around. I mean, this is the group of voters that mm -hmm. has been most up for grabs. They liked Kamala. They liked Beto. They liked Pete. They liked Liz. They liked Amy for a minute. They've been all over the place. And then when all the establishment figures endorsed Joe Biden, basically all lockstep went behind Joe Biden last night. That's why we saw this massive margins in Virginia, my home state, mm -hmm. which has become a very suburban state. How do you switch that back? How do you eat into those margins. And let me just say, um, one thing that I'm uh, talking about in my radar today, is it time to make a deal with Elizabeth Warren, who has had strength with those white suburban voters to say, look, let's do this together. Let's get you on the ticket. Let's do a united force of progressives where Bernie Sanders has the working class base, has the young folks, and Elizabeth Warren can start to win back the suburbs. I think you're right, and I think you bring up a really good point. And I think the biggest point there is you said that these people have wavered and moved around from person to person. Well, so I don't think that they're locked down in Michigan. I don't mm -hmm. think they're locked down in Missouri, two places that have a lot of those suburbs outside of St. Louis and outside of Detroit and places. So I think that we, part of our strategy, part of the ads, part of what we're doing with our organizing on the ground is going there and having that conversation and evaluating what worked for us last time and then what didn't and change that to talk to those folks who we know, as we would say in politics, are still persuadable. So right. that's going to be a big part of this is going there and having the conversation. Part of that's showing up and just having the conversation. And we know that Joe Biden and other candidates may not have built the infrastructure there. We've got people working in all those states. Chuck, one of the things I've always preached about having you on the show, we had you when Bernie was down, we had you when Bernie was up, and you were always honest about the pr prospects. What went wrong last night? Look, I think that there was this, we didn't account for a late surge. No, the establishment consolidated around one person. And thank God that we had this big uptick in Latino votes and we had upticks in other areas where we really had doubled down. You know, my focus last night was a lot on California, Colorado, and Texas. But those voters who were with Pete, those voters who were with Amy, like all of that coming together at the last minute, there's no way to gauge that kind of consolidation within 48 hours of an election. So that gives you not much time to react. Right. And in my business, you react based off of historical data of what you think is going to happen. And we had no margin of how to gauge that. And then you throw in some Bloomberg and $500 million. How is that? So there was a little bit of guessing because nobody knows. Well, guess what we know today? Mm -hmm. We know exactly what happened. Right. We know exactly where we fell and what we didn't fall, right? And so now we have a chance to react to that and not be over because we're still even on the delegates. So mm -hmm. everything could happen. That's a good point. And my closing point about Beto O'Rourke. We're not done this, with you yet. Yeah, yeah. My closing point when <laughs> you talked about. We minutes with you. Yeah. When you talked about Texas. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's still going to be a little a spur in, under my saddle, as they would say. Because <laughs> I really was trying to pull that out. Yeah. For uh, Beto O'Rourke and all of my dear, dear close friends in El Paso, uh, Bernie Sanders won El Paso County last night. Oh, well, uh, there you go. Very oh, so that didn't work out so very well, did it, Beto? One thing that I think is a legitimate point that people are making is that the idea of we're going to have this huge momentum, especially among young voters. I mean, I think your Latino ground game, I think you're right, tested, proven, turned out, made the difference in keeping Texas close in terms of the delegate count and running away with it in California. Also, the big win in Colorado. We don't want to overlook that as well. Um, however, young voters, it hasn't been there in terms of the numbers coming out beyond what, you know, sort of the average baseline is. Are you surprised by that? What do you think went wrong there? What will you do different in the future? I know one thing for sure is we spent a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of organizational bandwidth working on these young voters. We had these summer schools all through the summer. We worked and it really did help us in Iowa and New Hampshire. So think looking at that structure and the way that we've structured out these post Super Tuesday states is where the reevaluation will handle on resource allocation. One of the things that I've thought about moving in as we move into March, which is probably giving a little bit of the secrets away to the other campaigns, but I don't think that they're structured to handle this is spring breaks coming up. 
Good and you've got kids leaving to go to spring break. And I don't know if you've ever met a Bernie Sanders uh, supporter, but we're big on spring breaks. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe doing a little drinking and hanging out. But huh. like, I got to make sure they vote early and make yeah. sure that we have a plan to get folks to go vote early and be mm. thinking about all the different variables mm. that may happen. That's a great point, Chuck. All right, Chuck, thank, thank you, you so Chuck. much. We're going to have you Always in the great to have coming you. months. It's going to be good. Next on Rising, the coronavirus continues spreading rapidly around the world and here in the United States. How is it going to affect our diplomatic and trade policies with China? An expert weighs in when Rising continues.